Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 11057, and this is week five of Term 2, 2019. Thank you so much for everyone to join um, for joining us in this live session. Last week, we concluded by giving a very brief overview of criminal trial procedure. Conversely, civil trial procedure is uh, that which deals with civil matters. And um, civil law is very wide reaching. And while we tend to think of civil, civil trial procedure as that which applies in the magistrate's court, the district court, the Supreme Court in the state jurisdiction of Queensland, bear in mind also the federal jurisdiction where we have the federal court, the federal circuit court, and of course the high court. In addition to that, we have a number of tribunals such as the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal and the Mental Health Review Tribunal in Queensland and um, at a Commonwealth level, the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, uh, the Social Assessment Review Tribunal. So um, when we talk about civil trial procedure, there's a very, there's a wide range of courts and tribunals. So the comments are really aimed at the mainstay magistrates court, district court, Supreme Court at a local level in Queensland. So proceedings are usually commenced by a thing called a claim, accompanied by a statement of claim, but it is possible to initiate proceedings in civil procedures by way of application. Once you've filed your material, you then serve it, pr producing some evidence of having done so to the court. And then it's up to your opponent to decide what to do. Usually that would be in the form of a defence or maybe a defence and counterclaim. Occasionally there is no defence, or at least not filed on time, in which case you can apply for a judgment by default. Assuming that there is a defence filed, you have an opportunity to file a reply, and that is effectively the end of what we call the pleadings. So you'll hear about this term pleadings, particularly in civil procedure. It may be that um, at that stage, um, when there is a, a defence filed, you are of the view that um, the defence has no reasonable prospect of success. Or indeed, if you receive a claim, you may believe that that claim, the plaintiff, has no reasonable prospect of success. So in either situation, you can apply for a summary judgment, make an application to say, there is no defence, there is no claim, I want um, a judgment at this preliminary stage. It's not easy to obtain. Usually, at some stage during that process and fairly early on, the courts or the tribunals will consider alternative dispute resolution. And that's a wide, bra wide ranging branch of um, law. So when we talk about ADR, we're typically talking about mediation or conciliation, but there are a number of different um, techniques that can be used. Arbitration, for example, is um, at one end. And um, just as a, a plug, I do often take laws 12062, which is alternative dispute resolution, where we go into these things in depth. Once we've completed the preliminary steps, usually before a hearing is commenced, there'll be a certificate of readiness and then we have the hearing. Um, of course, that may or may not be the end of the matter. There might be some legal costs that are argued at the end of the hearing. And um, in the event of a judgment not being um, honoured by the unsuccessful party, then there may be some enforcement proceedings that need to be undertaken. Any questions then about that very brief overview of civil procedure? All good? When you're dealing with civil procedure, um, you'll need to consider the uniform civil procedure rules and also consider practice directions. Now, um, that's something that you want to bear in mind at all stages during your legal studies the importance of rules and procedures and practice directions, which really provide a practical application aspect to the material. And always think about the ethical issues that are involved in any step. All right, so let's talk about legal thinking skills. So in your textbook, you would have seen 
some good commentary on legal thinking skills. And um, we're going to talk about tonight legal logic, legal writing. But before we do, a quick digression. I can I ask a quick poll just to get you yes or no is all you need to, to provide. Has anyone had any involvement with community legal centres in Queensland or elsewhere, either by volunteering or attending? We're getting one yes, but a couple of yeses, but mostly no's. All right, let's see if we can change that around. A few people have done some work experience there and had some involvement. Go to this site, which is the Community Legal Centres Queensland site. No, that's not coming up. I think that must have been a different share. No, it's still not coming. Is that is that on your screen? Is that showing as Community Legal Centres of Queensland? It is. All right. I just um, I'm not getting the usual feedback from the from the the. Um, from the platform. So Community Legal Centres Queensland, and um, there's a lot of valuable resources there. An ability to contact, some notes about success stories, and some events that are coming up. So I was um, involved at an early stage in the Taylor Street Legal Centre in Harvey Bay, and many lawyers have spent considerable time at um, volunteer uh, community legal centres or as a volunteer at such centres. So please keep that in mind, it's a great opportunity. The other thing, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I think last week is the possibility of attending at a um, court just to introduce yourself and meet with individuals that are in practice. And usually people are very receptive to an approach and very happy to help and provide some information. All right, um, legal thinking skills is potentially much broader than you might otherwise think. And I say that because certainly when I went through law school, the major emphasis seemed to be on litigation. But now it's a much more holistic approach that we adopt. So if a client comes to you seeking advice, this might be the case for your third assessment for the take home paper. You need to consider not just strictly applying the law, but also thinking laterally to think about other ways to resolve the issue. I mentioned earlier tonight, the preponderance of alternative dispute resolution as a way of attempting to resolve the matter short of a court hearing. So that's one option, but there may be a range of options that are available to you when you're advising a client. So when you're providing the advice, be prepared to think laterally and be prepared to think in terms of wide ranging opportunities. So if for example, um, someone comes to you seeking a debt, there may be some preliminary issues that you need to consider. Is pursuing the debt the best alternative necessarily for your client? Can anyone think of, just off the top of your head, some reasons why instantly or um, immediately litigating the matter to pursue a debt may not necessarily be the best way to go? What are some of the things? Number one, expense. Yes, very good. Cost, the respondent doesn't have the means to pay, says Gary, that's an excellent point. No, no point chasing someone who doesn't have money. Tani says the debt may not exceed the cost and the stress. Stress is an important issue as well. And the person may not end up paying it at the end of the day, says Robin. Um, and Nathan says, well, maybe the contract for the debt is not enforceable. So there might be some preliminary issues there. Some of the other things, it may be that the debt is statute barred, which really follows on from what Nathan is saying. The other thing is that there may be a cost to the relationship between the parties. What if your client comes to you and says, look, I want to sue my grandmother for $300 that I lent to her two years ago. Um, 
is there a better way to resolve that type of issue? So um, is it possible that before you proceed to court, you can complain to relevant authorities? Maybe this is a matter for referral to an ombudsman, for example. So there are different ways that you can approach the debt and that's where I want you to think laterally in terms of um, the way you, you go about your practice. All right, so bear in mind, as I mentioned in week one, the quote in, at page 286 of your textbook, which is, thinking like a lawyer means keeping a cool and clear head and speaking and behaving rationally when others around you may be panicking or overreacting. Please keep that in mind throughout. Now let's digress to the IRAC methodology. We've talked about this a few times now, you're probably getting bored with it. You know that there are variations to IRAC, I-R-A-C, there's the MIRAC, M-I-R-A-C, CIRAC are different options. Um, one resource that you might find useful in that regard comes from the, Western, for the University of Western Australia, I'll share the page and what you should see, I hope, is the University of Western Australia IRAC guide for students, which provides some good examples and some facts. But there are many different resources available to you. It's important that you understand the principles behind this and that you can apply them. And for me, MIRAC, which is starting with the material facts and then dealing with the issues, the rules, applying those rules and coming to a conclusion is perhaps even more important because I think before you can identify the issues, you really do need to identify the material facts. Let's have a look at page 269 of your text. Um, and I hope it's 269 of your text. Some of these pages have changed around with um, different offerings of the textbook. So if you could just bear with me a moment. No, I think 288. We'll go to 288. Yes. All right. And um, the example at the top relates to Gia and Kevin. So please have a look at that and tell me what do you think of the material facts in this case involving Kevin's club? When you're ready, you can fire through some examples, or if you wish, you can unmute your microphone. So what's important? What's an important fact here? There are a few. Um, that silent, yes. silent Bob allowed um, the drunk guy to get on the stage. Yes. Um, so he's, he was in charge of not letting that happen and he allowed it to happen. And that can be important from a few different perspectives. So thank you, Nathan. I guess one of them is that um, there might be some personal liability on Bob, but the other is it um, would be important for you to establish that Bob had the authority of the owner, if you're pursuing the owner, in order to undertake that work. Paul says it's irrelevant that Gia was a patron. Correct. So that, that brings into play elements of contract, doesn't it? Glenn says there was an injury. Yes, without the injury, without being able to prove the injury, we don't have a case. Gary says, Gear accepted the terms and conditions to enter the location. That's important too. So you, again, you're looking at contract law and some of those issues that are um, very important. So there are some things that are not particularly relevant or at least not necessarily relevant on what we call causation. So does it matter that Gear is a university student? That doesn't matter on causation, but it may matter when it comes to dealing with the issue of damages. So when you're dealing with civil litigation matters, it may be that you first have to establish a successful claim 
And then second, establish what is the amount that you seek. Now, if Gia is a university student ready to embark on uh, an amazing career, which is extremely well paid, that may then be highly relevant in terms of what level of compensation that, per, uh, that person will seek, as opposed to someone who's, you know, in their 90s with no earning capacity into the future. You understand? So things like future economic loss may be relevant um, as a material fact, but it won't be relevant in terms of causation. It may be for damages. Okay, have a look now at the activity 8.2 on the bottom of the page and tell me what are the material facts there? What are important? And if you don't have a textbook, this will be a very difficult exercise to do. It's in the earlier versions as well. So this is the um, legal problem involving shopping for groceries where Catherine was looking at some avocados. All right, so Gary says, yes, this one thing that's relevant here is invitation to treat. Now, bear in mind um, that invitation to treat is a legal concept, legal conclusion. It's relevant, absolutely, but it's not one of the material facts as such. Now, Glenn says that the avocados are $1. Rachel says whether Catherine entered into a contract exactly, which comes back, comes back to Gary's point as opposed to um, an invitation to treat. So an invitation to treat is where someone indicates to the world a willingness to receive an offer, but advertising fruit for sale is not an offer to sell it. it might seem that way, but it's actually an invitation to treat. Um, Paul says that um, she selected the avocado is relevant. Robin says she hasn't left the store is relevant. Glenn says Ross is the store manager and Samara says put it in the basket. So there's some of the key issues, but depending on what the claim is that we wish to make, some of those may not be relevant. So Gary's identified correctly that there's an issue here about contract um, offer versus invitation to treat. An invitation to treat is an advertisement we're open for business, but it's not an offer. So if, for example, you see something that is obviously mispriced, then you can't pick that up and go to the counter and say, I accept your offer to sell this um, uh, I don't know, stereo for $3, when obviously it should have been marked as $300, because the $3 is really just an invitation to treat. There may be consumer law ramifications, but it's not an offer per se. I hope that makes sense. In this particular case, 8.2, it seems to me that the significant part relates to proceeding to the checkout um, at which time there would be the offer made by Catherine to purchase items. But until that time, there is not strictly a contract that comes into existence. Now it may be through conduct of destroying property and making it unsaleable that um, the old, you break that thing, you bought it might apply, but not necessarily the case. When looking at um, Kevin and Gear's case, and also Catherine and the store case, you'll see that amongst other things, apart from dealing with the material facts, you need to consider different areas of practice. Now, given that you haven't studied different areas of practice yet, that's going to be inherently difficult for you to identify, but not impossible. And I want you to think laterally and broadly in terms of the sorts of actions that might be brought. So again, we're primarily talking about civil litigation. It may be that um, there's issues to do with contract law, torts law, which is primarily things like negligence, consumer law, company law, and then there might be legal principles that come into play, invitation to treat versus an offer, or 
things like primary and vicarious liability in the case of um, individuals or those that stand behind the individuals, such as an employer. I hope I'm not moving too quickly or making it too confusing, but the point of exercise tonight is to encourage you to think broadly and laterally and use your legal reasoning skills to good effect. Okay, so let's go back to that activity 8.2. What's relevant, what's not relevant, and what are the legal issues? So it seems to me, it seems to me at least, that what is relevant is that firstly, Catherine's shopping at a supermarket. Number two, that she selects an avocado, puts it in her basket. Number three, attempts to return the avocado and is stopped by the store manager. I think that's relevant. What's not relevant is that it was a Saturday morning. It's not relevant that the avocados were on sale. The price didn't really matter. It certainly didn't matter that Catherine was planning to cook a Mexican meal. It didn't matter that she brought some, uh, had bought some corn chips. Um, it didn't matter that she'd left and then returned to the fruit and veggie section. And it didn't matter that Catherine had three avocados at home in the fridge. So when you're answering a legal problem, whilst it is open for you to make a specific statement about that which is not relevant, you certainly need to identify that which is relevant. Um, and it flows on that if you were making submissions before a judge, for example, you would wish to confine yourself to only those things that are relevant. What you don't want is that sharp rebuke from the bench to say, what's the relevance of this? Why do I need to know this? So part of your job is in legal reasoning is to quickly identify what is relevant and what is not. So what are the legal issues? Um, Gary identified the first, and that is whether it's a, an offer versus an invitation to treat, whether it's um, a contract or something less than a contract. And secondly, a legal issue is, ha is handling the fruit tantamount to acceptance of an offer? Um, I don't think so. Now, in your reading, you would have seen that there are different ways of reasoning, different types of legal reasoning. So this is, of course, all examinable um, for the take-home exam and should be part of your toolkit to some degree, I would think. So deductive reasoning is the first thing. Lawyers use deductive reasoning routinely. We don't identify it as such, but it's part of the skill of being in, um, a legal practitioner to do this. So part of learning this unit means that you, are, you need to understand what deductive reasoning is and then be in a position to apply it. So deductive reasoning is in a nutshell this. Number one, you state a proposition. Number two, you make a statement of fact. And number three, you draw a logical legal conclusion from that. So you got that? Let's give an example, simple example. All X's are Y's. You with me on this? All X's are Y's. This Z is an X. Therefore, this Z is a Y. Does that make sense? So it's a bit of legal logic. To flesh that out, all dogs, X, are mammals, Y. This animal, Z, is a dog, which is X. Therefore, this animal, Z, is a mammal, Y. Okay, so that's deductive reasoning. Make sure that you can spot that and refer to it probably in your toolkit. Inductive reasoning is making a prediction based on experience. That's inductive reasoning. Reasoning by analogy is what you'll see often when reading cases. Certainly, reasoning by analogy is a staple for arguments around legal matters. You'll need to do this more than likely for your take home paper. So and the, the background, the, the idea of this is because a certain thing is like something else, then reasoning by analogy suggests that one thing will have the characteristic of another thing. 
But you do need to be careful here because this can easily become faulty reasoning, reverse accident or hasty generalisation. So what is faulty reasoning? Faulty reasoning is a sweeping generalisation. That's one example. So if the main premise is overstated, then all the conclusions drawn will be invalid. And it's easy to do. It's so easy to make a sweeping generalisation. We see it all the time. A hasty generalisation is one where there is simply not enough evidence. And you need to be careful because the hasty generalisation looks similar to inductive reasoning, but it's not. Another example of faulty reasoning is attacking the person. In other words, and we see this so often, but just because a person has a particular trait or characteristic doesn't necessarily mean that a bad person um, will always have that certain trait or characteristic. So just because one bad person has it doesn't mean that all bad persons will have it. Appealing to authority, this is the opposite of attacking the person. So appeal to authority is um, this. When a well credential person, what a well credential person says is not necessarily true. And one of the things about legal practice is that it is required that you challenge authority, but do so in a respectful manner. Now, an example of this is that the High Court may come to a decision of 4-3, four, four people in one going one way, the three going the other way. Um, so it's okay to have a different view in relation to legal matters is really the point. Appeal to majority, just because most think it is so, doesn't necessarily make it so. So that's um, faulty reasoning to think, well, because most people think this way, it must be true. And I'm sure you can think of many examples from history where the majority was simply wrong and proven to be wrong as a result of arguments down the track. A straw man argument is the practice of unfairly misrepresenting or exaggerating your opponent's claim. We see that a lot and you've got to be prepared to argue against that. And irrational correlation and causation. So I'll give you an example and you can see what I mean by a correlation that is irrational and a causation that simply doesn't make sense. So during the last 100 years, we have seen less pirates and more global warming. Therefore, global warming is caused by a reduction in the number of pirates. You see what I mean? It's an irrational correlation. It doesn't make sense. Now, all of this is in relation to your ability to be a critical thinker. I can summarise it by saying that to be a critical thinker, you need to be reasonable. And you can certainly argue against a proposition, but you need to, and you can be critical, but not criti criticise for the sake of criticising. It must be an informed criticism. So ask yourself, whenever you're presenting an, a response in a legal question, is your argument reasonable? And some of the key questions are, is it based on reliable evidence? And is it based on valid assumptions? And have I avoided that which constitutes faulty reasoning? So does your argument contain validity? Is it consistent with primary sources of law, legislation and case law? Is it consistent with ethical standards? All right. And at page 308 of your textbook, the authors say critical thinking is an, an act of thoughtful disobedience rather than thoughtlessness, thoughtlessness or automatic disobedience. All right. Are there any questions about what I've been saying tonight? I know I'm doing a lot of talking. Does anyone want to make any comment 
share any examples, ask any questions, challenge what I'm saying. These are all worthwhile things. Any comments? It's important for you to try to work this into your psyche, as it were. Now, Paul, have you got an example or comment? Take that as a no. All right. Um, Sorry, my my um, you right, Paul? thing yeah. didn't unmute. It's supposed to do that when I press the space button, but it didn't. Um, yeah, so, uh, right, where was I? Um, a while ago at work, I was serving this customer. We got to a quick, quick, quick chat and um, he gave me an example of uh, faulty reasoning that I thought I might share. Um, I'm not sure how he got onto the subject, but apparently um, he claimed that most people who have tattoos are prostitutes because he sat down with a phone book and called all the prostitutes and asked if they had tattoos. That's a pretty dramatic example of faulty reasoning. Absolutely. Thank you, Paul, for that. All right. Um, now, Nathan, you've, you've got some questions. Would you like to ask that? And if it's about next week's, that's fine. We can deal with that now and we'll come back to what we're talk discussing. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, this is probably a silly question. I'm sure you've answered it already. Um, but I was reading this week's textbook, uh, chapter six, about CCH and Westlake and all those research resources. And that's been one of the parts that I suck at is research, like legal research. I'm sure I'll get better, but I was just wondering about any, because some of them ask for payment or signing up or logging in and all that sort of stuff. So Westlake want you to join, like sign up, and I'm not sure if they actually charge. I did see there's a payment and pricing section. Um, someone just said our library is really good for that, but I'm just wondering if CQ have any other resources or avenues out there where we can log in with our login details or... Absolutely, and it's West Law. Is the West Law? Yeah, why did I, did I say West Lake? Yeah, sorry. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. So West Law. <laughs> um, so Emily um, correctly says our library. So absolutely, you should know how to log into our library, and mm -hmm. there are many resources through West Law that are available in our library free of charge, even though outside the library system they would be paid resources. So if you just Google and you go straight to Thomson Reuters or um, LexisNexis, um, and you try and go through their resources, they will say, we need you to sign in. But the best thing I think is to go through the university library while you're logged in. And whilst we, we don't pay for every resource that's available, the key ones are there, um, so they're free. Does that help answer your question, Nathan? Yeah, that's perfect. That's, I'll, just, I'll just get really good at looking at that resource. Absolutely, yes. No worries. Yes. Good. So, Emily, you've obviously been into the library, the digital library. Yeah, so there's a whole section called database, Nathan. That took me, I didn't find it straight away, but you just find that you scroll down and it'll say database and it's all in there under the alphabet. So that's the easiest way to do it. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Good. Okay. And I do plan to talk about um, some research skills shortly. So I'll just move through a couple of other things to do with legal logic and some skills. I'll invite you to read page 310 of the textbook, which provides for critical skills. Now this is really important. So page 310 of your textbook, and you want to note this for future. I think I may have mentioned this early on. I'll mention it again. You need to understand what we mean by interpretation, analysis, evaluation, inference, explanation, or self-regulation. And then when you're answering any legal question, look at the first word and answer it in accordance with that. So if you're asked to analyze something that is different to um, being asked to explain something. Now it might look the same, but they're not synonyms. So you need to understand the difference. Have a look at page 310. 
So these are the skills, but you need to put them into action is really what I'm saying. Page 316, Attributes of a Legal Practitioner. I appreciate that we have many people that are studying this unit that are not going to be lawyers, um, but if you wish to be a legal practitioner, they're the attributes that you need and they're listed on page 310. To be inquisitive, alert, self-confident, open-minded, flexible, fair-minded, honest, prudent, diligent, and persistent. And you need to have the ability to be a creative thinker. Right, let's um, just talk about some legal research issues. I'm now going to ask if you could, each of you, please identify your favourite two legal platforms. What are your go-to platforms? What have you found to be the best when it comes to legal research? Now, there are hundreds of them. So we're getting some votes in. Westlaw and Jade, says Gary. Ostley and Westlaw, says Kieran. I'm going to have to move fast here. Ostley and Lexus Advance Pacific. Lexus Advance, Ostley Westlaw, Ostley, Ostley, Lexus, Ostley, Lexus, Nexus, and Queensland Law Online. Ostley, Lexus, Lexus, Federal Register, Westlaw, Ostley, Lexus, and Westlaw, Ostley, and Lexus. So we're getting a lot of votes there for Ostley, Westlaw, Lexus, a few votes for um, Law Online, uh, Federal Register, so in the Federal Register of Legislation. It's important that you find the ones that work best for you. Now, a quick yes and no. I can ask if you have looked at any of, say, my legal research videos even if you haven't been through them all. We're getting a few yeses. Thank you. All right, good. Um, so rather than repeat what's there, I'm just going to highlight a few things. The first is, if you have not looked at the Federal Register of Legislation, you must do that this week. Now, when I say this week, you've actually got two weeks because remember, next week is a holiday week so we won't be meeting next Wednesday evening. It'll be two weeks from tonight, which is the 28th of August, when we next meet online. So you've got two weeks. You must have a look at the Federal Register of Legislation. You must also look at the Queensland Legislation website. And of course, I'm sure that everyone's looked at Ostley. If you haven't looked at Jade, please do so. Jade is great. and. If you haven't been through to the Queensland, Central Queensland University Library, you must do that in the next two weeks. And when I say go to it, I mean really have a good look. So even though we had a lot of votes for Lexus Advanced Pacific and Westlaw, and CCH was mentioned earlier, you need to go into those websites and look around. Just enjoy the process. And don't rush it, give yourself some time. You'll pick up some wonderful things in there. All right, all good with that. That's the mandatory stuff, you must do that and be familiar with it. But there's some other places I'd like you to go. Legal PD is good. Um, do have a look at the Queensland Land, sorry, the Queensland Law Handbook, which is Caxton Legal Centre. It's a great resource and uh, it's very comprehensive, a great way to look at material from the outset. Go to Queensland Courts and definitely go to the Supreme Court of Library of Queensland. The online presence, and if you can make it there in person, please do. So the Supreme Court Library of Queensland, we're gonna add that to the must look at list for this week. Now, can anyone tell me what I mean by bench books? Who knows what a bench book is? And who's actually looked at a bench book or bench books? Right, we're getting an answer here. Christine says, judges books, question mark. The books magistrates refer to for authority, says Gary. Any other votes? Bench books. 
magistrates, cheat books, court process, says Catherine. Well, it's not just magistrates, it's judges as well, legal practitioners, and um, uh, the general public. So bench books are a fabulous resource. So when you're studying criminal law, I'd urge you to look at the bench books because the bench books will provide you with an overview of what the judges might say to a jury when explaining concepts such as self-defense. Referring to some cases and the, and the material is footnote referenced, so it's very authoritative. So if you are struggling to understand what these things mean, then go to the bench books and you'll see some great explanations. But there are many bench books. Um, there's the Domestic and Family Violence Protection Act bench book, which is excellent. There are a whole range of ben bench books on different topics. So if you, if you research that, bookmark the ones that work for you and make sure that you have had an opportunity to um, um, have quick access to that material into the future. Also look at the Queensland Sentencing Advisory Council. It's an excellent way of looking at um, independent research. It's an excellent publication around sentencing. Sentencing meaning um, the sentence imposed by a judge or magistrate in relation to a criminal offence. And looking, going back to, to bench books, Renee says it's to do with how judges write, uh, judges write judgments, and that's true to a degree as well. So when we look at legal research, there are a few steps in general terms. You need to understand the context. You need to be able to look at legislation. You need to consider case law and you need to consider the presentation of your material. So they're the four basic steps, if you like. So we'll break that down. Context is where do you begin approaching a legal problem? You might use IRAC as the template for solving the problem, but you must understand what databases are available to you and develop a search strategy for your future use. Now, this is the sort of thing that you put in your toolkit. So I'm really giving you some very specific advice about assessment two now. The second step, legislation. You've got to have a clear idea where you find the leg legislation, where you find the regulations. You'll need to understand how you cite them. Please have a working knowledge of the Australian Guide to Legal Citations 4. For example, if you're referring to legislation in assessment work, please type it in italics. Likewise, the names of litigants in a case, type it in italics. And make sure that you do some basic referencing material correctly, such as pinpoint referencing. Anyway, so legislation, you need to find the legislation. You need to know how to cite it. You need to identify what legislation is up to date and current. Can anyone tell me why on earth, as lawyers or law, law students, you might need to consider the legislation as it was in the past? Why would that be relevant at all? Ah, Kieran says purpose. Interesting. Rachel says in case it had been amended. Gary says to make sure certain parts that are relevant have not been repealed. Yes. Robin says at the time the offence was committed. Yes, that's pretty close to the answer I was looking for. To understand the judgments on past cases, says Suzanne. So some good responses there. But if you're dealing with a dispute from four years ago, then bear in mind that the dispute will be determined by reference to the law as it was at that time, unless the legislation is expressed to be retrospective to have if even though it was passed last week it's said to have legal effect as at 2014 or 2015 for example and the general premise is that legislation is not of retrospective application if you're acting for a person who's charged with a historic sex offense from the 70s then you need to be able to access the law as it was in the 70s. So when you're looking at legislation, be aware of the need to look at 
the legislation as it is now and the legislation as it was at a particular time. So if you don't know how to identify that, you need to know that. So in the next two weeks, you must learn how to find legislation as it was at a point in time in the past. Ostley is great, but on that topic, my preference is the Queensland legislation website, for example, if you're looking for Queensland point in time legislation. Um, and also, Suzanne's right, you can really only understand the judgments and put them in context as the law was at the time, if you're going to attempt to use them into the future. All right, so um, the second step then is legislation. Third step is case law. So you need to find out where do you find the cases? How do you cite the cases? Australian Guide to Legal Citations. You need to understand the difference between that which is authorised and which was unauthorised. Can anyone tell me what, what, what does that mean? What's an authorised report as opposed to an unauthorised report? Or give me an example of a report, a series of reports that are authorised. Primary versus secondary, not quite. Authorised is published in the law reports. Close, not quite. Well, unauthorised are also published. Uh, although published in law reports, yeah, that's probably that's probably right. So I'll leave it for you to have a look at for that. CLR, Renee, Renee says CLR is authorised and that's correct. So the Commonwealth law reports. Um, Matthew says he's authorised by a judge, yes. So if you're looking at a case, you may find it reported in authorised form and unauthorised form. So where possible, cite the authorised report. Now, can I just ask this, um, and I won't, I won't give names, but I just want you to be honest here. Have you all looked, actually looked at cases, um, at least more than one during this unit so far, or have you only been reading about cases from summaries, etc.? We're getting yeses, good. Yes, a lot of it in statutory interpretation. Good. You must look at cases. Uh, to be honest, when I first started studying law, I didn't realise that you actually had to go to the case. I thought we'd just read about it in the textbook. I, I learnt very quickly that wasn't the case. So you must be able to read cases. Samara says a lot in contract. I'm sure there is. Good. So get to learn how to read cases. It's very important. And it's very important to be able to learn how to do a case note. So a summary of that. And then you need to present the material, which is the fourth step, putting it all together in a professional manner, properly referenced. Now, um, everyone knows how to use footnote referencing, don't they? Does everyone know how to use in Word program, how to do a footnote reference? If anyone doesn't, please find out now. It's very important. Good, everyone's saying yes to that. Um, has everyone looked to some degree at the Australian Guide? Robin says, where do you actually find out how to do a case note? That's a really good point. Um, I think in the legal research material, did I touch on that? Anyone who's seen it? No, okay. Um, Rachel said, oh, thank you, Rachel. I can post one to Moodle that was given to us in statutory interpretation. Thank you, that would be excellent. Um, it's really important and here I'm saying it's important, but I haven't given you an example. Good. So you need to present the material, you need to understand the Australian Guide to Legal Citations for just the basics will, will do you at this stage. We've mentioned a few of the things tonight. Um, firstly, you don't reference your material in the body of the text, which is really Harvard uh, referencing. If you refer to Donahue v Stevenson, or as we call it, Donahue and Stevenson, 
then you, won't, you will not put the citation generally in the body of the text. So Donahue and Stevenson, footnote reference, and put the citation in the bottom. When you complete a citation, put in a full stop at the end of it, just like a sentence, and um, uh, make sure that you put it in italics. Pinpoint referencing is very important. Don't just you know, refer to uh, Donahue and Stevenson 20 times without telling me what page or paragraph it's that you're referring to. Because if I'm reading an assessment, uh, you know, I want to find out, I want, I want you to tell me what page or paragraph. So that's pinpoint referencing is very important. Are there any questions about the Australian Guide to Legal Citations, referencing, presenting your material? You've got my sample guide. I really want you to leave this unit knowing those basics. There's a reason for this. It's not a great reflection on you if we get to second year and you really don't know how to reference material correctly or professionally. And guess what else it's not a good reflection upon? Can anyone think? Me. Yes, Nathan, on me. So um, I don't want anyone to fail in that regard. I want you all to learn how to reference to a reasonable standard. You don't have to be world champions at it, but we've got to get the basics right. Now, having given you that warning, and even though I was very lenient and I'm, I'm well advanced in the marking of the first assessment, by the way, it's all very good. What do you think I'll be like when it comes to looking at referencing material in the second and third assessments now that I've given you that warning? I'm going to be a bit savage, aren't I? Relatively to the fact that much more critical, much stricter, yes, yes. Allowing for the fact that your first year, mercenary, um, I will still be reasonably tough. Okay. So what are the basic skills to research, adopt a systematic approach, know where to look, know um, how to identify good quality information, read actively and efficiently, you need to speed read versus perusal. Perusal is a detailed reading, depends on the circumstances. Think laterally, brainstorm, and apply your research properly. So have a look at page 203 of the text in that regard. Have a look at page 205 for the way in which you might go about planning your research and your research methodology. Um, so you need to then apply the research in a practical way. Ostley is very important. I think you all know that now, but you must know how to use the search facilities. So practice learning, searching the legislation only. So I'll give you an example. If you want to do some homework, and I think I refer to this in the videos, have a look at the Acts Interpretation Act 1901, Commonwealth, and in the tab, search this legislation only, insert the words interpretation and constitution, see what happens. Um, then use note up, go to section 15AA and learn how to use the note up facility to find cases relevant to particular sections. Now, does anyone, can anyone tell me what is an explanatory memoranda or an explanatory note? Do we all know what that is? We need to do that. Do we have yeses? We've got a no. We've got some yeses. It's attached to explain a bill, second reading of the bill. It provides indication of the purpose of the legislation and the meaning behind the act. Good. All right, so again, we've got two weeks, so you've got plenty of time for this. You must understand what we mean by explanatory memoranda or explanatory note, and you must be able to find them for both state and federal. When we're talking federal, it's explanatory memoranda. When we're talking Queensland, it's explanatory note. Different words, but it means the same thing. So it is something that accompanies the bill that's introduced into parliament, and it explains the intention of the bill. 
So if you're looking at from a statutory interpretation perspective, what is the purpose behind the legislation, then pretty clearly you're going to have to look at the explanatory memoranda or explanatory note. And we can't do that if you don't know how to find it. So you must, in the next two weeks, be able to know what these things are and find them. Am I being too tough or am I being realistic? You can give me a vote on this. Is it, am I being too tough? The correct answer is no. Realistically tough, I'll accept that. Okay, thank you. Because we're getting towards the halfway part of the unit, so we've got to be well advanced now in our legal research abilities. Uh, you do play around with the search engines and have a look at some of the connectors. So if you go to Osley, for example, you'll find, I forget whether it's top right, top left, there's, there's a guide to how to use Osley, top left. Sorry, was that top right, Nathan? Okay, top right. So top right, and have a look for Boolean connectors. So connectors are a way of putting words together in a particular way. So typically it's something and is the connector something else, but it might be that the connector is not. So something not something else. If you're trying to identify, you know, to remove a whole range of things that aren't relevant. So I'll give you a bit of um, a research topic to choose as you wish. Have a look at Ostley. Go to the Police Powers and Responsibilities Act. Go to section 754 and use the note up feature to find relevant cases. That's just an example. Otherwise, see if you can find the Queensland Criminal Code. Have a look at section 24, see what that's all about. Then from a Commonwealth perspective, see if you can find the Australian Consumer Law. I'll give you a hint. It's Schedule 2 to the Competition and Consumer Act of 2010. All good? And then have a look at the Federal Register of Legislation or the Legislation Register, as it's called. This is authorised commentary. It provides up-to-date legislation. It provides information about changes to the law recently. And there's plenty of information there about how to, le to read legislation and how to use the register itself. There's also information about bills. All good? All right. So when you're doing this research, Please take your time, don't rush it, it's not a race, and I do genuinely do hope and expect that you will enjoy the process of getting lost in this, um, and it's a worthwhile exercise. Even if you're not practicing in law, whatever field that you work in, you will need to consider almost invariably legislation. So if you're going to learn some of the tricks now, that'll hold you in good stead, no matter what, I'm sure. Okay, before I wrap up, are there any questions, comments? Are we all good? Yes, Nathan. Um, with our feedback, uh, sorry, with our grades on our assignments that we do, can you give us feedback? I, just, I haven't done an assignment in like 10 years, so, um, you know, this will, this will be my first. I will, that's a good question. Um, what I plan to do is this, and I'm working my way through the portfolios now, is I'll provide you with a mark out of 20. I won't break that mark down. It'll be a single mark. Yep. And I'll provide you with some brief overview of um, what I saw as being relevant for the portfolio. And I'll provide you with written feedback. So the feedback that you get from the university will generally be in writing. Sometimes it might be audio feedback. Um, which I've used a few times, but on this occasion, I'll be providing written feedback. And um, I hope to have that feedback and those results available to you by the early part of next week. 
So yeah. any luck. No worries. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you. But any other questions, comments? All good? All right. Thank you very much for attending. We'll see you in two weeks. All the best. Bye then.